This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. Hi there, I'm Ray Reynolds. I'm the minister at the Somerdale Church of Christ, and I work alongside Billy Lambert with the Getting to Know Your Bible Ministries. Billy is out with uh, recovering from surgery, and while he is away, I'm going to be studying with you the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up there to Philippians chapter 4 as we put a bookend on our series on having Christian joy. Today we're going to be talking about having contentment that will lead us to joy. We're going to be studying Philippians 4 verses 10 through 23. I'm reminded of the story about a man who was a, a rich man going to a large lake to go fishing. And as he came to the lake, he brought his big boat, and he was about to launch it into the water. He noticed that there was this old man, old fisherman, sitting there propped up against a tree. His boat wasn't in the water, uh, and his truck was sitting there just waiting, and he's out there chewing on a piece of straw. So the rich man says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I've already caught all the fish I need for today. And he said, well, why don't you catch more than you need? And he said, well, I only needed a few. I don't have any need to go out there. He said, no. The rich man said, you need to go back out and go fishing, get you some nets, catch a bunch of fish, come in and sell them. And he goes, and then what would I do? He said, well, then maybe you get even better nets and bigger boats and you catch more fish. And he said, and then what would I do? And he goes, then you might actually be able to sit back and relax and enjoy life. And the man said, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> he understood that you catch what you can when you can and don't overdo yourself. Uh, today I want to talk about what it means to have real contentment, to be able to say in our heart and our mind, I am doing all that I need to do, or at least the best that I can do, and I am going to enjoy the time that I have left. Kind of a Solomon-like mentality based on the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, before we get into our message for today, I want to encourage you to sign up for the free Bible Correspondence Course. Information is available on our website at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. Also, the 1-800 number and email address that will be here on the screen. You can reach out to us. The course is absolutely free, and it will help you get to know your Bible even more. So that you can learn more about the course and how you can receive it, we'll pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational, it's based on the Bible, it's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580, or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. Our text for today comes from Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. Read along with me. Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Oftentimes when we come across a chapter, we tend to pick out something that we like. We tend to pick out something that really rings true. Many of us, if we've read Philippians 4, may have highlighted, it's underlined in my Bible, verse 13. It's one of the most important verses, one of the most powerful and well-known verses uh, ever written. And so we run to that passage. But I, I want to show you, I'm not going to talk about verse 13 yet. I want to show you what he's trying to teach in verses 10 through 12. Because you'll never be able to have the strength to do what you need to do until you have found true contentment with Christ. Until you finally realize that all that you will ever need is available to you in Christ Jesus. In his ministry with his disciples, Jesus frequently talked to his disciples about sacrifice. He talked to them about what it means to be a true disciple, to leave behind things, and to be able to look forward to new things. Uh, oftentimes the words and phrases are used, the difference between the old and the new. And so here what Paul is saying is, as a child of God, I have got to learn that the only thing I really need is a good relationship with my God. That's what I need. That's what I am to pursue with everything in me. And when I do that and I find true contentment, all the things that I have ever needed 
will be provided. God is a God who understands. He has purpose. He has will. He has mission. He has a goal in mind for each of us on this planet. And one day he's going to call us home. We've already talked about our retirement plan, but we need to make sure that every single day we are focused on doing what God needs us to do and being content with what God provides. There are four things here in this text, these last few verses, that really grab my attention. And the first one is having this great love and appreciation for God and what he gives. When I was a young child once, I remember going and visited my aunt and uncle. And I loved visiting them very much. And we went on a Sunday afternoon. I believe it was a Sunday afternoon. It was a, su- it was a, a Christmas time. And we went over there and they had a present wrapped for us underneath the tree, my brother and I. One present each. And I remember opening up that present and my brother opening up his present and we could still see the stacks of presents for the nieces and nephews and other people. And I remember opening it up and looking at it and going, is this it? Is that all? And now as I've grown up older, I realized that that was a terrible Uh, issue of judgment. I I was young. I was just a little boy, but I remember thinking, is that it? And they were like, yeah, that's it. Unless y'all are ready to eat. (laughs) It's like, yeah, sure. We'll take the food. But I I remember, I I think it was little green army men that I used to play with. And I loved the gift, but, uh, but I was a little bit hesitant. I thought maybe there should have been a little bit more. Well, fast forward about 20 years, I took a a gift to one of my nephews, uh, three of them, and I I took some gifts to them. And uh, as they were opening up the gifts, one of them said, is that all? (laughs) And so in a way, I was repaid for what I had done to my aunt and uncle earlier on in life. We need to be content with what we have. We need to be content with the things that we have in our possession and not worried about what else we can obtain. You know, it's a multi-million dollar business in America, maybe multi-billion dollar business at this point, to own self-storage units. You've seen them. They're on every street corner. In fact, uh, back when I was young, people always said, well, it's another bank or it's another uh, you know, restaurant or it's another whatever. Now, it seems like every corner is getting these self storage units. Some of them now are three and four uh, floors high, and they've got mechanized systems to take and transplant big storage containers. We probably have things in our attic and in our basement. We have things stacked up in closets, probably in closets that are so tight full of junk that you can't hang anything in there anymore. We have storage units outside. We fill our garage. Uh, Just this last week, We have a three-car garage at our house. One of them, well, two for a while, but now one has been completely inoperable because we've had boxes in there from our move. I finally moved it, and my son says, thank you so much, I can park inside. Well, winter's almost over here, but he's finally able to park his vehicle inside so we can get the three cars inside of that garage again. And, And sometimes we do, we have so much stuff. We have storage units and garages full of things And as a friend of mine told me one time, I bet I could go into your stuff, take 10% and you wouldn't even know it. 10% of the things that you have in storage. In fact, it probably would be a welcome thing. There are certain things that I've kept in my possession thinking they were so precious and so treasured. And when other people see it, you know what they see? They see junk. I asked my wife one time, I have, uh, we have junk drawers. Y'all have those in your house, junk drawers? We have these junk drawers in the house. I have two, at that time, two junk drawers in the bedroom. One in the side table and one in the dresser, completely full of just odds and ends. And I asked her one time, I said, what are you going to do if something happens to me? What are you going to do with this drawer full of things? And she says, well, what's in there? And I told her, um, I'm, a, I'm a big movie fan. I love a uh, certain genre of movies, sci-fi movies. And so every time I go to the theater, I see, save the little movie stubs. And in places that I have been, if I have memories, photographs or something like that, I have autographs from certain celebrities, I keep in this drawer. And I said, what are you going to do with all that stuff? And she goes, well, I'm probably just going to throw it out. (laughs) And I said, well, I'll help you. And I started going through those things. And most of the things that I had saved and that I had collected, they weren't worth anything. It's just sentimental value. And I don't want the day I die for my family to come in and go, what are we going to do with all this stuff? 
When people come to my office now, I have a, a rule. And by the way, if you're ever in the Somerdale area and you want to come by the building, I have a rule for people that come into my office. If you come in, you're going to leave with something. I'm going to give something to every person. Sometimes it's a book. Sometimes it's a piece of candy. Sometimes it's a little knickknack or something on the wall. I try to make sure every person that comes in and out of my room is given something. It's a surefire way to get rid of your things. Uh, if it's junk, you might want to hold off on that. But I like to give stuff to people. And so when we have an abundance of things, we're supposed to share. And we can't really appreciate the things we have if we have so much stuff. We need to learn to be content. And one of the ways to contentment is to have this love for God first. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things you need will be added to you. God provides he gives the things we need. Our problem is not the needs being provided for, it's that we have great wants. We want something so badly. In many cases, people will do anything to get what they want, and that's extremely dangerous. And as a Christian, may it never be said that we were uh, supremely needy and in want of things all the time. We should be happy and content with what God has provided. Keep reading with me in the beginning of verse 13. I can do all things... Through Christ, who strengthens me. If you have a highlighter or a pen, mark that verse. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, that, that really is sad. It's sad to see that when Paul began to collect the funds that were needed that this one church was the only one that met those particular needs on this one occasion anyway. Paul is talking about being, uh, being given that Macedonian call. Remember in chapter 16 when he goes in to the city of Philippi and he ministers there uh, to the people and converts Lydia and the Philippian jailer and others, that he was there going about doing good, preaching the gospel. And he had that Macedonian call. He knew he needed to be there teaching and preaching to these Gentiles. And while he's doing it, he says that collections were needed to give to those uh, that he had ministered to. And here he says, you were the only ones. You know, you tend to remember the people that are good to you. You tend to remember the people that were there for you all along, and it blesses you to know that there are people who always have your back. Paul's saying this to remind this church, you had my back when I needed you the most. When I was in a dire situation, you stood with me. When I travel to different places and work at different places, I know the churches that have supported me prayerfully and financially, and I am grateful for that. We are grateful for, for anything to help the work of the kingdom of God. And so when people help us, we, are, we, we have a tendency to just praise, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for those particular blessings. And this is what Paul's doing. Thank you. Thank you for giving what you did. And so there's this great love. But their offering was not just out of love, it was also out of faith. They knew that Paul would use that money for the appropriate reasons. They could trust Paul. You need people in your inner circle that you can trust. You need people that you can share things with and know that it will be used for the exact cause. There are opportunities we have from time to time to help people that come in for benevolence. And at our church family, we, we try to help people and be benevolent as much as we can. But there are many times people come in and take advantage and they don't use the funds for the right possible reasons. And that's hard. It becomes, it's a challenge for us as Christians because we harden ourselves if we've been burned too many times. Somebody comes to us and they say, I need help, and you help them. And then they don't use the funds you help give them to help with, and they use it for something else. You become hardened to it. Now, like for instance, when you let people borrow things. I've borrowed things before, and I take it back. I try to keep it in good condition. But many times people have borrowed things from me, and they haven't returned them. And that, that makes you a little frustrated. You say, well, I, I loaned it to you. But yet Jesus reminds us that when we loan, we shouldn't expect it back in return. We should just expect that at some point, God is going to bless us for whatever we may happen to lose. And you know, God is so good and provides so much that if our worry is about stuff, and our worry is about things, then we really have got the wrong mindset. 
going back to what he's already told this church, have the right mind. Have the mind of Christ. There is nothing on this earth that you can take with you. Nothing. Your soul will be the one thing that goes on into eternity. And so as much as we want this stuff and these things, they aren't going to help us to be any happier. The most miserable people in the world are in Hollywood, California. The people that try to get all the fame and all the fortune and, and not trying to be harsh or judgmental. But there are people that will waste their entire lives looking for something. And the one thing they need, contentment, was available the whole time contentment in Jesus Christ. We put our faith in things and they will definitely disappoint us. But you put your faith in God and you will never be disappointed. He will always be with you. He will never forsake you. He is by your side. Jesus promises this. He is again the Prince of Peace and he brings contentment and peace into the life of his people. And then we in turn should go and share that with other people. Notice beginning verse 16. Paul says, For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the first conclusion. There's a few more verses. But the idea here is he's saying that their work is what brought him contentment. The work, the service of these other Christians had helped him to become content. He says, I have everything I ever need. It is provided for me. And he says, there's other churches that have helped, but you, you are the one that I, is on my mind right now. You have helped me in abundance. And, and he says, not only, it wasn't just the gift. The gift, people often get consumed by the number, the price tag of a particular gift. In fact, one time I, I gave my son something. It was of, of considerable value. And I gave it to him and he said, did you get it on clearance? <laughs> he knows me well enough to know I'm very frugal with the money that I have. And I said, well, son, yes, I got it on clearance or you wouldn't be having it today. We try to be as, as careful with the things that we have, the money that we have to be able to be used for particular purposes. But it's not the price of the gift. Paul says it's not how much you gave. It's the opportunity that you took to use your time, your energy to provide this gift to me. And, and clearly, uh, as he talks to these Philippians, he says even in the beginning, you know, when he was with them, he saw them giving. And then he says, I have seen it and I am seeing the fruit of your labor. Now, there's another part of this, one of my favorite verses in chapter 4. Verse 13 is great. Verse 4 is great. But I want you to listen again to these last two verses that I said at the end of this little section with the first conclusion. He says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. If you were to come to me and say, I, I need some help, I need some finances, I'm limited on what resources that I can give. And people that are around you, they're limited on the resources they can give. Many of us as parents, we have given to our children over and over and over again. And they, they, it's almost like they expect more provision, but there will come a time when we'll run out. Money runs out. Time runs out. But our God has supply houses, storehouses, overwhelmingly full of blessings. Jesus will tell his disciples, and James will repeat something similar in his letter, that God supplies because you ask. You don't have it because you don't ask for it. God has storehouses of blessings waiting to bestow. I wonder when we get to, into eternity and get to heaven and we have conversations with God, if we might ask, you know, why didn't you answer this prayer with an affirmative yes? God knows why certain prayers are not answered, mainly because we probably couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle the request if it were granted. As an example, I had a lady ask me one time, she said, how is it that I continue to ask for financial help from God and I ask for money and he doesn't provide? And I said, well, maybe it's because he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows that you would use that money and squander it quickly and you would not save it. You would not use it for the Lord's work. How many of us, as a matter of inspection of our own hearts, 
If we were to be given a million dollars in cash, how many of us would give every penny away? Many people wouldn't because you're thinking about the, the mortgage on the house. You're thinking about the loan on the car. You're thinking about college education. You're thinking about your own student loans. You're thinking about uh, all these things that you want and you need. And I could finally maybe go get that other toy that I need, that other item that I want. Maybe the reason why we're not given more provision from God is because he knows we would abuse it. Now, there's enough people in this world that abuse the blessings of God. Why tempt and struggle with his children doing the same? So when we are given something, we, like the widow with the two mites, we give as much as we possibly can. We want to help people as much as possible. You say, well, Brother Ray, I don't have financially the resources to help a lot of people, but you do have wisdom. You have experience, life experience. And the experience that you can share the things, the wisdom that you can pass on to others is much more valuable. And let me tell you, the most valuable thing that you can provide to people is your presence, just being with them. I had a family one time, the grandmother and the mother of this family uh, was passing away. And we gathered there in the ICU room for hours as we waited for her to take her last breath. We sang songs, we prayed together, I didn't offer a speech. I didn't offer a sermon. I didn't quote any Bible verses. We sang some church hymns and we prayed together. And we did this for, like I said, hours. And when she finally passed, as we left, the people there, the family members and friends that were present say this, was, this, this felt like one of the most uplifting things we've ever done, all being together. And would you know that the people felt that that was so valuable, the Christians that were assembled there praying the Christians that were assembled there singing did more good than they could ever imagine. No financial uh, offering could replace such a gift as our time. For our children and our grandchildren, we need to spend as much quality time with them as the, we can. I still hold very dear to my heart some things that my grandparents have given to me and my mother. Strangely enough, my mother had a disease called lupus and she died at the age of 53. She was very young. And I thought, you know, it was terrible. I dealt with lupus my whole life. My mother was diagnosed when my brother was born, just 18 years, 18 months younger than me. And she was diagnosed with lupus. She had it my whole life. She was sick constantly, in and out of the hospital. And I thought, you know, when, when, when my mother died, I, I thought that's terrible. It's a terrible disease. I've seen other people that have it. But I think that maybe uh, it's behind me to worry about that particular sickness. And then I met my wife. And she was full of vigor and, uh, and excitement and joy. And she was a very happy person. But as we got to know each other in time, I realized that she also had the same disease my mother has. My wife has lupus. And I struggled with that at first. I thought, man, that, how could this happen again? That my mother had it and now my wife has this same debilitating disease, this same terrible disease. But I know that we serve a God that is able to answer prayer. And I know that I myself can learn from what my mother went through and I can share that wisdom with my wife if she is not completely healed of this disease. My mother wrote a book, a journal, called My Lupus Journey. And she wrote in this journal all of her thoughts. She even wrote down medications she took. She wrote down treatment options that she had went through, including chemo and radiation and things like that, all the medicines. How was I to know when my mother died and I took that journal and put it into my library that my wife would eventually be diagnosed with the same disease? The best counsel that my wife receives is not from her doctors. It's from my mother who passed some time ago but wrote down those thoughts. You have wisdom to impart to your children and to your grandchildren, your time with them is the most valuable asset you have. If you have friends that are struggling, call them, pray with them. If you have people that you can visit, go and visit them. That time is valuable. Your work is essential. And that's what Paul's lifting up here, is the relationships. This is a church that needed to cement their relationships with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, with the church family. And we need that today, and that leads us to great joy. Then finally, these last few verses. Greet everyone or every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Paul says once again, earlier he talks about the palace guard. Now he says there are some in Caesar's house that greet you. How neat is that? That Paul had taken the gospel all the way to Caesar's house. There's a little bit of a, a hint on that in Romans. We'll have to cover another time. But, but Paul's saying there are people here of influence, political leaders of the nation that he had impacted for the cause of Christ. Many people believe that he converted some of those people that were of Caesar's household. And so what an encouragement to this congregation that they're, they're being spoken of positively by Paul to people in a position of authority or to a royal household. Uh, you just can't get much better than that. And they know, the Philippians do, that their financial resources that they had sent Paul and the visitors that they had sent to Paul to encourage him helped make this possible. The work that goes on around the world, the work and the ministry that goes on is because every person is doing their share to make sure it happens. This is where hope comes in. The hope that great things are on the horizon. You know, I think about the brethren sitting down and reading this letter. I bet they read it cover to cover. They probably had it read publicly over and over and over again to just be encouraged by it because they knew they needed this joy Paul spoke of. And this great hope was because of them. They were making an impact, though very small, making a huge impact upon the kingdom of God by them supporting Paul and supporting the ministry of Paul and these other brethren, Timothy and Epaphroditus, more and more people were being brought to Christ. I think that's a great message for us and for the church today, that if we have joy in our hearts and we then in turn share it with others, It'll bring joy to everyone here on the planet. Every person needs this joy. And you and I have it as an abundant, overwhelming resource from a God who says, I'll supply all your need according to my riches. God's needs or God's riches are great. He owns, as the psalmist talks about the cattle on a thousand hills, he owns every hill and all the cattle and all the hills. But just to show how rich and how, how, how wonderfully gracious our God is, he says, my God will supply according to his riches. All that he has in abundance, he will give to his children, but he expects us to then share it with others. Well, it's been a great study of the book of Philippians, and the idea of having Christian joy today is a message people need to hear. And you know, this is one of those great subjects in the Bible that maybe we want to study a little bit more. And there are a lot of great Bible subjects to study, a lot of great Bible words to be able to study. Wouldn't you like to get to know your Bible just a little bit better? We want to encourage you by signing up for a free Bible course, which we mentioned a moment ago. We offer this to you at no cost so that you can learn more about the Word of God. We encourage you to check out gettingknowyourbible.com for that and other resources. And call the phone number today, email us, let us know how you want to receive the course, and we'll get it to you. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. That's our prayer. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible. P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580 or call 1-877-711-5214.